Glass Pavilion. My name's Maura. I'm going to be your narrator today. We got Colin over here turning on our air compressor. He's going to be what's called our gaffer today. So for anybody who's never seen a demonstration, I'm going to really quickly go through the equipment, but Colin's sort of our person making the piece. So the gaffer is really the person in charge. So to start off, we have our lovely furnace. This thing's rocking about 2150, and it's full of about, probably about 400 to 500 pounds of molten glass. Inside there sits a ceramic crucible, which is basically just a big bowl, and we can throw in cold glass, take it up to temperature, and it's all ready to work with. Then we have our lovely pipe warmer, and I'll show you our blow pipe really quick. This is what Colin's gonna actually make our piece on. And hot glass only sticks to hot things. So you'll notice this has a nice cherry red glow with a cold pipe. That glass is just going to be bubbly and gross. Oh, this is our blow punchy too. So you'll notice when Colin starts actually inflating our glass, he's going to do it through this nice little tip. So we have punchy rods and we have blow punchies. And blow pipes are actually just hollow. Then we have our nice reheating chamber. Um, you'll notice once Colin starts pulling glass out of the furnace, it's going to cool down really quickly. So this is at about the same temperature as the furnace, and we can reintroduce the piece back in there to get it up to working temperature. Um, we also have our pipe cooler down there. If anything ever gets too hot, we have to cool that pipe down. And then we're, today we're going to be doing something extra special, and we're going to be using our pickup box. So you'll notice Colin is going to grab a, color, a piece of color later on, and he's going to do it right out of that pickup box. So he's going to go ahead and get that started. Colin's going in with what we call a punchy rod. And I'll use punchy a couple different ways, but this is just sort of referring to that pipe. It's a nice solid pipe. Colin's got a little tiny glob of glass. He's rolling it across our marble, and he's making what we call a post. So Colin's picking up a chunk of color bar, which is this stuff. And color bar is rolled out solid glass. So all of our whole tank um, it's all entirely colorless glass. Since this is an open access studio, we like to make sure that everybody can make their own work here. So a way for us to work around that is that we can have our nice little pickup box, our little chunk of color bar, and Colin can pick that up and add that on. And we can talk a little bit about how glass color really works later on. Oh yeah, that's a little chunk. That'll totally work for a fade. Colin's going to heat that back up. That pickup oven's sitting at about 900 degrees, which is what we call a kneeling temperature for glass. And it sort of sits at that nice room temperature state that we're familiar with, versus the glass Colin pulls out of the furnace is gonna be really hot and gooey. So Colin's gonna heat that up. I can take that if you wanna start your bubble. No, it's not. It's gonna take it, I'm gonna heat up anyway. Okay. <laughs> I can show it to him. So it's got that nice little bit of glow. That's how we can tell it's going all the way back up to that working temperature. Colin's going ahead and he's making what we call a starter bubble. So we could just take this color and we could stick it directly onto a pipe. But since I said this is a community studio, if we were to all just make orange items, sorry, hold on, give me one second. Quick focus. If we were to just have orange glass in there and we were to just stick it to our pipe, since everybody's using these pipes, eventually they would all turn orange and then everybody in the studio is making orange stuff. Then everybody's mad at Colin. So you can already see the heat difference and you can really tell even as I'm rolling it across our marble how the heat changes. Our marble. Our marbling tables are made out of stainless steel, sorry. And this allows us to really cool the glass in specific ways while we're shaping it up. Do you want the oak? Okay. Colin's coming on out. You see Colin has that nice little bubble. And I'm guessing when he put that in there, he did something called a cap and blow. So he can physically blow into the end of the pipe, cap it off and trap that air in there. 
And since that air doesn't have anywhere else to go, it really wants to go where glass is the hottest. So it'll shoot right to that nice tip. Do you want to put a line in this? Or do you just want it? Yep. You ready? You want to wait a little bit? Okay. So Paul is getting ready to take what we call an overlay. After we do this, I'll show you a little bit more of an example. But an overlay allows us to sort of trick the viewer into thinking this object is all one color. So we can take this tiny glob of glass, smear it over top of the clear. And since these are both the same type of glass, they're automatically be compatible. And we can make it look like it's one color. Oh, you're going to take me right there? OK. So Colin's going to go ahead and grab me with his diamond shears. I'm going to raise up. We can stick that right on there. And that's all he really needs to make this entire piece. Colin's going to try for a little bit of a special color technique today. He's going to be doing something called, we call a fade or a blow through. And that allows us to sort of push the colored glass into specific areas. And as we start to inflate, you can really see how it changes. So Colin's going to heat that up. And we like to say that glass has a memory. So every time we touch the glass with a tool or do something with it, it's going to remember that heat. So since Colin has that nice cold bubble underneath, he can really heat that chunk of color up and really spread it across the entirety of his bubble. If he lets the whole thing get too hot, he can really start to crank down on that color. But if that bubble gets too hot, it'll really start to change the shape of it. Our bubble is not so much of a problem right now since it's so small. But you'll notice as Colin starts to inflate, thick glass performs really differently from thin glass. So he sort of really wants to protect that bubble and make sure it doesn't get misshapen. And we have a couple different types of color that we can use. Um, I showed you guys the color bar, but the other type that we have is called frit. And this just sort of gives a different visual look to the glass. This is sort of like sand. I've heard people call them like sprinkles. The color bar we preheated in that pickup oven, but that frit we can just pick up right onto the surface. So if you look at some objects through the collection, you can really tell the difference of how the color is applied. So if we were to look at something that looks one color, but we know is made in a glass studio, we know it's using color bar. But frit can give us sort of a painterly approach. And you can use that in a lot of different ways. Comes in all kinds of different sizes, all kinds of different colors. Um, we don't actually really melt our own color here. Glass color doesn't really work like paint color. We can't really take red glass and blue glass and make purple. Glass color is made entirely chemically. So what are you working with today? Uh, Yellowish Aurora. Yellowish Aurora. Yellows are tough. I'm not actually, certain glasses you add certain metals to. So we could take a color like copper blue, just add copper to clear colorless glass and it'll tint the whole pot blue. Um, manganese purple, iron makes green. It's super easy and simple. A color like this is going to have a really complicated recipe. So the reason we don't really just make objects in one color is when you see factories like Libby making that, they have an entire furnace that's just that color. So they can make a whole run of blue, and they'll make blue for like two months, and then they'll make purple for two months. But since our furnace is in use so much and we're used by so many different people, we add all of our color separately. And these are made in different by different manufacturers around the world. Colin's using Reichenbach color, which is made in Germany. There's one in Germany. There's one in Portland, Oregon now. And I believe there's one in Australia. And these come from all over the world. And one of the challenging things about CHOP is that color. And since it's transparent, which means we can see right through it, you could take another transparent color on top and make it sort of change the color a little bit. So what I know a lot of people will do is they'll have a really bright color like red, and then they can put a nice wash of brown over top to sort of settle it out and make it look nice and even. 
Now that column's got his color on, it's gonna give it a little puff. Make sure his bubble's nice and in there. And now we can start really adding layers on in here. When we're working in here, we can't get all of the glass that we want to at once. You'll notice when Colin goes and he gets a gather, that glass is going to be really, really gooey and it's going to move around a lot. So we're really working in layers. So Colin first had his starter bubble, which was a nice solid cold layer. And now we're going to let this layer chill out even more. Can you raise the oh, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and give this bad boy a break. Oops. So what I'm doing in there is that since we are our studio, we charge color. So we throw a clear glass, we put it in. And sometimes when we can do that, we can have some bubbles. So I'm just pushing all of those bubbles off of the surface of the furnace and physically pushing them back and popping them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Trying to pop them. <laughs> the nice thing about glass is that it has a couple of like very certain properties. So when air gets trapped in there, it makes those little bubbles. Sometimes we can use those to our advantage. So we could take baking soda, actually, and mix it with water. And Colin can dip his glass in there. And since that glass is so hot, it doesn't really break like you would expect it to. It's still in that molten lava state. So Colin could take this thing and he could like smack it around on the ground and it's gonna be totally fine. Colin's using our wooden block tool. We do have a very specialized tool set in here since that glass is so hot. Most of the tools you're sort of familiar with in other mediums wouldn't really work in here just because they'd burn or catch on fire. So most of the tools on Colin's deck, which is, this is his gaffer bench and this is his tool deck. So most of them are made out of steel. Some of them are made out of wood. Um, they're made out of a special type of wood. They're usually made out of a fruit wood. I think in this case, Colin, everything Colin's working with is cherry. So cherry wood has a really tight grain pattern. So there's not a lot of sap in there. So it really waterlogs really nicely. You'll notice some of the tools, we'll use some wooden paddles later on. Those can catch on fire pretty easily, but since it has that nice waterlog, our block tool is using something we call the Leidenfrost effect. And it's never actually making contact with the wood, at least if Colin uses it correctly. It's really just creating a steam barrier. So the steam is what's actually physically changing the shape of the glass. And glass naturally wants to be in this nice round shape. You'll probably hear me talk about the Q-tip shape a lot. When we take the glass out of the furnace and if Colin were to just turn, you'll notice it likes to stay in that nice Q-tip shape. Glass doesn't really like to be angular. It wants to stay nice and round and gooey. Colin's putting a little bit more air in there. He's using a lovely blow hose, which is a nice tool that sort of allows us to work by ourselves. I know Colin's done a lot of glass blowing on his own, which sort of isn't really the norm. In school, we all went to school for this. In school, you really learn to work with the team, or at least I did. Most people learn to work by themselves. It can just be challenging. This stuff is really taxing on your body. So if you do this for a long time, Colin and I are in our 20s and I know we both already have like strange body problems from doing this as a job. It really helps though when, you, when we're able to, to work with a team. So if we were making a piece that's any larger than what we're gonna make today, we would definitely have a, three per, a third person and they could even take heats, just sort of help out, move tools around. As we start to get larger and larger, we'll start opening doors on the reheating chamber. And even having somebody to open and close the doors can be really helpful. You taking another dip on that? Yeah, one last one. We're gonna take one more dip on this. You'll notice every time Colin goes and he gets more glass, he's really doubling the size of, his, of the piece that he's working with. So it's hard to sort of control what you're working with. If Colin goes in there too hot, it can really easily fall off into the furnace. 
and that can cause it to sort of, well, A, it'll tint the whole furnace orange, and then everybody will be bad at Colin, because everybody's making orange glass. Not gonna happen, though. But that's not gonna happen. I've only seen that happen once, and then you just sort of fish it out really quick. So Colin's got our second dip. He's taking what we call a strip gather. I'm sure you guys can hear that lovely sound. So it's really tough to control how much glass you're getting in there. So that strip can sort of allow us to peel some of that glass off. One of the biggest properties of working with this material is using gravity. And you'll notice the entire time Colin's really turning and trying to keep on top of it. He's doing what we call keeping on center. So you know, when you take a pottery class and you throw your pot, you center your clay at the beginning. The entire time Colin's really using his left hand to really keep this piece centered. You would think that you do all the tooling with your right hand, so your right hand would be really strong. But every glass blower I know, their left hand is much stronger, just because you really have to power through all that material. You don't really get to take a break. So now that Colin's got all the glass that he wants, he's gonna start shaping this up a little bit. Oh, I forgot we're doing the fade. Are we doing the fade still? We'll see. <laughs> Since Colin has all that clear on the bottom, as we start to inflate this, we're hoping that it gives it a little bit of a fade from the top to the bottom. This can be really challenging with some colors because when glass color is hot, it's not the color that you expect it to be. Since it has those metals in there, those metals want to glow really bright. So you can really see the colorless glass and you can see where it's clear, but you can't really see where it's a color just because of that bright, bright glow. Colin's going ahead in with our newspaper tool. And the newspaper tool is really nice because it's just really eight to 10 sheets of newspaper folded up. It's waterlogged just like our block, but this is the closest Colin can really get to touching it. So when you're working on a piece, you wanna be able to really feel the sides of it because we can't like sit it on the table and look at it and see how we're gonna use it. When we're working in here, we have to sort of think at a 90 degree angle. So Colin's going to go in and he's going to really feel the profile of the object. And what Colin's really working on right now is blowing out our shoulder. We sort of refer to the bubble like a human body. So the shoulder is sort of up by the neck, and the neck is where the pipe meets the object. And our shoulder we want nice and thin, because it, when we're working on this, we're really working on it from the top down. So it's sort of the opposite of pottery where you pull up. So Colin's marvering our bottom, and remember, glass has that heat memory. So the entire time he's inflating, it's gonna remember that. And you'll notice it's gonna inflate more towards the top, and he's got that nice layer of clear at the bottom. Oh yeah, I think that's faded. You can see how it's a little bit denser in the color at the top than it is at the bottom. It can be really hard to tell just because of those metals when they start glowing. So we sort of have to wait for it to cool down a little bit and then we'll really be able to see the true color. I know that's one of the things that frustrates me when working with the material. I feel like, I, you want a door? Can I go ahead and open a door for Colin? Once things start getting along and they start getting hot, they can get a lot more wobbly. So it's easier for us to be able to open those doors up. I don't think Colin will need more than one today, but if we were making something wide, eventually we'd have to start opening up more and more. So Colin's gonna go ahead and he's gonna put in our jack line. And our jacks are sort of our iconic glass blower tool. They're modeled after a pair of shears. So it's basically two knives stuck together. And another one of those properties of glass is that you need to break it off of the pipe. So what we do is we make a really tight constriction line, and this just sort of tells us, tells the material where we want it to break. Colin's doing it nice and quick. And he's even inflating a little bit, because it can be really easy. You don't want to go in there, you don't want to crank on it. You want to be really gentle with the material. When we're, we're familiar with glass, we're familiar with like really hard and dense stuff. But when it's hot like this, it's really malleable. It's almost like honey. When we bring it fresh out of the furnace, it's really ooey gooey and molten, but even you can see the difference from then to now at how Colin's manipulating it. 
Now that Colin's got that lovely constriction line in there, we can start working on the rest of the bubble. So Colin never really wants to heat up that constriction line because the glass wants to get the hottest to where it's the narrowest. So since it's really narrow at the top, if it gets that whole thing hot, it's going to be a lot more work to keep on center because it's going to be so floppy. So Colin's just heating from the shoulder down. So we can start changing the shape of this. This can be tough because you have to get a really long, nice heat. When you'll notice when we're coming in and out, if Colin stays out of the, the overheating chamber for too long, it can be a lot longer for him to really crank that heat back up. When we're working in here, you're really working with heat and it's sort of working with time because the hottest the glass will ever be is when it comes freshly out of the furnace. So if Colin and I were working production style and you guys weren't watching, we could really crank stuff out if we really wanted to, just because we have that nice fresh furnace heat. So Colin's using a little bit of gravity and since he has that bubble wall and he's got that thickness on the bottom, all of that weight on the bottom is actually physically pulling on the walls of the glass and sort of elongating it, making it nice and thin. We want to keep that bottom nice and thick. And we're using sort of a principle called bottom weighting. So when we're working in here, we can't physically feel the object. Like, Colin can't set it on the table and see how it works. You sort of have to plan ahead a little bit. And since glass is such a fragile material, if Colin were to make this pitcher, which is something that's designed to be functional, and he were to make it really top heavy, and we leave it on a shelf or something and a cat knocks it over, if it's top heavy, it can really easily wobble and fall over. So he's really reinforcing that bottom weight. Now he's got a nice tube and he can start inflating a little bit. I'm guessing this yellow is probably a little bit stiff. Since all the glass colors have different metals inside of them, they can make things really complicated. So when Colin's working with a color for the first time, you really don't know what you're working with. So colors like blue will heat up really quickly and they'll get really molten and move around a lot. Whereas their yellows have different metals in them that make them really tough to heat up. So you'll notice Colin will spend a little bit more time at the reheating chamber than usual. He's gonna go ahead and with his paper, give it a little bit more air. It can be really challenging to make stuff in here. So if this is the first time Colin's making a shape that's designed to be used, usually you'll have to make it three or four times before you real feel really happy about it. Paul knows he's been doing this for a long time. So really when you start working, you sort of have everything fall on the ground and break. But after you start working with this for a while, you really understand the design principles of the material. So there's certain limitations that we have to follow. Do you want to paddle? Uh, a moment. In a moment? I'm to get more volume. Okay, I'll just be ready. Colin's going to give that a little bit more air. I personally hate working with yellow just because it takes so much time to get it hot. And you can really see the difference in heat if you look up by the moil or the pipe head versus the bottom of the piece. Some of it's rocking bright glowing orange and the rest of it looks red. Colin's giving that some nice air. And when he's blowing, he's not blowing crazy hard. If he were to get fresh glass out of the furnace and actually start blowing really, really hard, he could create something called cellophane glass, which is basically like a balloon. So we can actually pop the material. When we're working in here, I know the thought is to work really hard and push really hard, but the material is so gentle. And every time you touch it with a tool, it remembers it. So if Colin takes his jack and he puts the jack line in a place where he doesn't want it to be, it's gonna be there for the rest of the life of the piece. So you either have to throw it away or start over or sort of make it work with it. I'll take a paddle. A paddle? I'll paper it. Keep it okay, you want me in like the nook? So we're going to use this wooden paddle, and this is going to allow us to create a nice flat spot on the bottom. And as Colin's rolling back and forth and we're moving across the paddle, it's really gently making a nice flat spot so it has a nice point of contact with any sort of table it comes into play with. Just nice. Colin's giving it a nice little indent. 
And when you look at something called a wine, like a wine bottle, you'll notice it has that indent on the bottom. And that's to really make sure that it's making really nice contact with the table. Do you want a punty? Okay. Colin's gonna give you a nice look. You can see that little bit of a ring. That's sort of one of those design principles you learn early on, just to make sure that your object is really usable. And there's a lot of different ways of working with glass. Usually when we're making demonstrations in here, the quickest thing is to really make functional work. But if Colin were making a sculpture or something like that, he really wouldn't have to worry about it making contact with the table. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and make Colin a punty. I'm gonna put a little heat on this pipe. Uh, I lied, it's okay. And this is gonna be sort of a bridge that allows us to flip it around. If we were to just break the piece off of the pipe right now, it's gonna have forever have that jagged edge. So I'm gonna make Colin a tiny little Q-tip shape. And this will just let us flip it around. But the nice thing about glass is that hot glass fuses to hot glass really well. So we can just stick this on no problem. I get really quiet here because I have to focus. If I bring Colin a bad punty and we try to stick it onto the bottom of the piece, it can really easily cause it to crack and break and fall right onto the ground. That'll work. So I'm gonna cool this pipe down just so that when Colin touches it, it's not super hot. I'm gonna let him sneak out. I'm gonna heat this guy back up. And since Colin put that jack line in, it's sort of telling the glass where we want it to break off. So Colin can go ahead and stick me on he wants to make sure he's nice and center, so he's going to turn a little bit. Sorry, it's a little cold. I'm good. So Colin's going to take a couple drops of water, and he's going to put it onto that jack line. And he'll physically tap that off of the pipe, and that reverb is enough to physically break the glass off. So now we can start working on the top. I'm going to give it a quick flash, and now you'll really hear me start to talk about flashing. Flashing is just sort of maintenance heat. So now that this thing's off of the blowpipe, it can really easily get too cold and crack and break. What's up? Oh, okay. So you'll notice Colin doing a lot of flashing keeping the piece happy, keeping the punty happy. If I make Colin a really bad punty, it can really easily cause the piece to fall off onto the ground. So we gotta make sure we got nice insurance. We're gonna do the handle first with him. Okay. But it'll be fine. You're gonna open it. This is our longest reheat. So this glass was just cold enough to break, and we have to take it all the way back up to that working temperature of about 2,000 degrees. So you'll notice Colin is up and down and up and down. Normally we run around a lot. So this is always the heat that's the most frustrating. I always never take enough time up here, and then I sit back down, and then I go, oh no, and I gotta get back up. Do you want another door? Okay, here, I can close it. Gonna close, Colin. You start opening, opening them up. Heat sort of leaves the reheating chamber a little bit, so it can be a little bit colder. But it can also be pretty hot for Colin. One door is sort of no big deal, but once we start opening all of them, that's when you start getting really, really hot. That's the time where we really have to work in shifts, so nobody can stand in front of the reheating chamber with all the doors open for like an hour. 
it's just way too much on your body. Well, you, can. <laughs> you can, but you shouldn't. <laughs> The thing about this is that you do it for a long time, so you really have to think about your body. So when you start your school and you're 19, you're like, whatever, this is fine. And then suddenly you're 25 and you have wrist problems. I'm like, what's happened? Colin's gonna go back in with this paper and make sure this is nice and on center. If he sticks his punchy on and it's off center at all, and he starts to open this object up, it can totally look off center and wacky. So Colin's just making sure everything's nice and even. Are you gonna trim this? <laughs> so we're gonna take this. Colin's using what we call our tweezers, which are just regular tweezers, but they're made big and made out of stainless steel. So he's physically pulling this, and this is gonna both get rid of that icky edge from the top, but also thin it out a little bit. Do you need a puff? Okay. So Colin's gonna tweeze, he's gonna tweeze and then he's gonna make another jack line just like the one we made before. And he can use that to physically break it off so it's nice and straight. So once he's happy and he keeps pulling, Colin can pull and pull and pull. When glass is hot like this, it's really malleable. So if Colin got this base hot enough, I could grab the end of it and probably walk across the studio, no problem. Colin's putting another jack line in. This time just at the front. The tough part about this is sometimes this can really cut off your fade if you're working on the fade. <laughs> so we'll see if we have any fade left at the end. So when Colin's working on this, he's gonna really isolate the cold. So every time he touches the object with his jack, it's really chilling out just that specific area. Oh, are you ready? Okay. So Colin's gonna go inside and he's gonna chill the interior of that bubble. And then he's gonna come back out and chew the exterior nicely. And that should be enough of a heat difference for me to be able to just give this a quick tap. And then the whole thing breaks off. That was a little harsh, Colin, sorry. This can be a tricky move, because if I really crank down on that thing, it can really easily cause the bubble to come off of the punchy. But if you hit too lightly, it won't actually break off. So that's why Colin's gotta make sure his heat's right. I'm not a maniac, and it works out fine. So now Colin's got that nice flush lip. Now we can start physically opening this up. And you'll notice Colin has a really small tool deck. He uses a lot of his tools for different things. So Colin's gonna take our jacks and he's gonna start to use them like a mold versus how we used them before to really cut that line in. He's gonna slowly but surely open the top of this up. And when we're working in here, we're always working in the round. So Colin can't just rip it up open with his jacks. It's gonna cause a big indent. He's gonna slowly turn and physically the turning is what's doing the opening more than the tooling, which is what he's doing with his right hand. I'm gonna open it. You want a paddle? I'm gonna take one of these nice wooden paddles, and these are the same cherry wood that we used for the block. And we can use this to really make sure everything's nice and flat. The hardest part about working in here is that you can't actually touch the material. You sort of have to wait patiently until it's done the next day. So Colin's gonna go in with his jack. He's gonna lift up a little bit. I'm just here making sure this is nice and straight. He's gonna open up slowly. This color especially is being a little tough. It doesn't look yellow. I'm very excited to see what it actually is. Okay. So since Colin's making a picture, he has to really think about how people are gonna use it and what sort of liquid they're gonna put in. So he's gonna go in and he's gonna squeeze that neck down a little bit. And then we can open it a little bit more. The toughest thing about making glass that's designed to be used is thinking about how you have to clean it. 
the column's got to make sure that hole's wide enough for somebody to physically get their hand in there, but also narrow enough that it looks nice. Got that nice hourglass shape. You want to do one more? Yeah, it's all right. You can put like a couple of nice drinks in there. Yeah. yeah. Water. Some lemonade. <laughs> when you really get into it and you look at how different cups are made, you really start to notice why cups are made a certain ways for different drinks. And then people get really into it. Colin's giving that a nice squeeze. I'm gonna have to go back in it. Yeah, just a little bit. This is where the paper's really nice because Colin can really feel the profile of the object. So if Colin's just working with his jacks, he really only has a limited amount of shapes he can make. Everything's very angular. But that paper can allow him to go in there and soften it up a little bit. Okay. I'm going to be back here with my paddle. Yep. Make sure this is nice and straight. I don't know if the liquid's going to know where to actually pour out of, but... <laughs> we'll work on that later. Yeah. You want to do it again, or...? That's fine. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and make Colin a handle, since he's making a picture. And handles can be really tough, because we can't really work on them and attach them on cold. So I'm going to bring Colin a nice hot glob of glass, and it really only has one shot to get this right. So usually it takes a lot of practice. So I'm going to get what we call a double dip. So we're going to let this set up a little bit just so it has that nice core on the inside. And then I can go ahead and go back in. If I go back in right now, you can see how it's really, really glowing. That's sort of one of the indicators I have, that it's too hot to go back into the furnace. Another one is if I stop, you can see it sort of move a little bit slower. If I come right out and I stop, it's going to fall right to the ground. I'm going to let it set up a little bit more. All right, I think we're good. I'm going to roll it across our marble table, make a nice cylinder for Colin. And I don't want to make this too long too quickly, just because Colin's going to have to pull and stretch it out a little bit. Is that enough of a point for you? Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you have another couple baskets on the monitor? Okay. I'm going to let Colin flash really quick. Then I can go back in there and get it nice and hot. You want it hot, hot, or? Okay. What? Tacky hot? Oh, taffy. There's not a good scale for heat in here. It's sort of just done by experience. I think that'll be good. Yeah? I'm going to come straight up and down. Then he's going to cut. And he's going to go right down. If Colin stays up in the air and leaves the handle right up, it can really easily fall and tag back down onto the piece. He can stick that down. And remember, glass has that memory. So you'll notice he doesn't want to stick it down right where he cut it. He's got the cut mark, and he's going to rotate a little bit. You want another door? OK. Oh, good. 
It's been a while since I brought a handle. <laughs> yeah, this thing. See, Colin makes that look really easy, but Colin's probably made like 10,000 handles before you start to make really nice ones. So now Colin's going to use what we call a torch. So Colin's using a map gas. And when we go into the reheating chamber, it's going to heat the entire piece really aggressively. This is going to allow him to just spot heat certain areas. So he's going to make sure that cut mark is nice and smooth. When we cut the glass with any of our shears, it does sort of have a jagged edge to it just because that steel will cool it down so quickly. What? Now we're doing the spout. So spouts are sort of one of the harder things to make, even with like teapots. Oh, oh there we go. So that can happen sometimes. Sometimes we lose the piece. That's just down to that punchy connection. So remember when Colin put a little bit of water on that jack line earlier and then tapped the pipe? That's the reverb that physically breaks it off of the object. So that happens a lot. You sort of, when you're working with the material, you get really used to your objects breaking. So if Colin were to make two or three more pictures, he'd probably get it down pretty easy. But I know it's been a while since he made one. So if we were to take this glass, and you can really see the color now. So I don't think it's really yellow. I think it's sort of an orange situation. Yeah. But we could take this glass. If it had made it not on the floor, we would load it away in our annealing ovens. And when glass is hot, it doesn't really, we can't really let it cool down in the air. The air is too cold. So even with that piece, that air is too cold, and it causes a crack and break really easily. So we would cool it down slowly. And if you come and you visit, um, the museum is open. I think we're open Wednesday through Sunday. We'll close Monday, Tuesday. You can see we have a really large bench in our ancient gallery. And that bench annealed for about 11 months, and it still has these teeny tiny bubbles in it and cracks. So that means it really needs to do anneal for about six more months. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and comment them below, and Misha can read them to me. Other than that, I think we're all wrapped up. So thank you guys so much for watching. I know we have a backlog of tons of other demos. If you want to watch those, you can see us put a piece away in the box. But other than that, thank you for joining us.